Okay, so in the uh, previous lecture, we were looking into uh, we were looking into the fact that we seem to agree with the fact that we require nonlinearity in order to get the amplification that we desire. And we also saw that the type of amplification that we desire is the power amplification. Now, when you it it need not necessarily be the case always. Sometimes you might want only voltage amplification without getting power amplification. And we saw an example where such cases you can get away with. For example, a trivial example is that of a transformer. But this course will focus on those devices or those type of circuits, which can enable you to get power amplification, right? So with that in context, we saw that in order to get power amplification, we need two things. One was, firstly, the system has to be nonlinear. Obviously, you have an input port and an output port where the load is connected. And also, you will need a you will need a DC power supply, right? Because without that extra power supply, you will not be able to extract the extra power from which you can uh, you can have, you are planning to uh, give uh, uh, from which you are planning to extract and provide to the output. So this this we uh, this we covered heuristically and with some log diagrams, and then we at the end of the previous lecture we were deal, we were we started to look into we started to look into uh, uh, developing a framework of making a nonlinear circuit work and also use that for our analysis purposes. Right. So why do we need a framework? The basic reason we need a framework is because a nonlinear set of equations will not be able to solve new. Uh, analytically, right? Only few sets of types of nonlinear equations you can solve analytically, not all types. So, uh, having said that, we'll have to uh, develop a framework so that we can actually go about doing it, right? So, let's. Uh, uh, we also, I also gave you an example of a typical case where, let's say, I am plotting the motion of a vehicle or motion of a cycle or whatever you, uh, motion you want to plot with respect to time. And let's say this is S of t. And let's say time t equal to zero, it was uh, it was at, at the origin. And after some time, when you plot, you see it has, a, it has a trajectory like this. And then we said that this is a nonlinear. Uh, this seems like uh, this, uh, the path that this guy is taking uh, is uh, it, it's not, I mean, the distance that he's covering is not increasing linearly with time, right? So, so if I, if I uh, characterize this motion in terms of polynomial equation, let's say I try to curve fit, I'll, I'll not be able to curve fit with respect to a single polynomial, uh, with respect to y equal to mx plus c, for example, right? It, it cannot be fit with a straight line. We require higher order polynomials, correct? And what is the order of the polynomial that depends on how accurately you want to you want to fit the curve? So having said that, but now uh, if uh, the question that obviously comes to us uh, that and that that is posed to all all of you when we are faced with such situations and we want to analyze it, then what do you do? Do you always resort to numerical simulators, or can you get an intuition as to how? The trajectory will evolve with time, given that you know where you are at certain point of time, right? So uh, the motivation for this work is a, 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 a motivation for this argument is this: that let's say at any point of time, t not, or rather not any point of time, at a particular point of time t not, I know I am here. The vehicle is here. This is s s c not, and I want to understand where the vehicle will go after some additional time delta t, right? So one way to approximate this is to say that if I if I know if I under if I make the assumption that the vehicle was moving at a constant speed, right? If I know if I if I if I know that, then I can easily multiply the speed with delta t to know my subsequent position after a time interval of delta t. So in order to get the speed, what do I need to know from this plot? Slope. Slope at what point? At t naught, right? Great. So I need to know the slope at t naught. I figured out the slope at t naught. And when I 
uh, so essentially what I am saying is I extend this till delta t and I'll get a point. This point will be my extrapolated S t naught plus delta t, right? So naturally you see that I have incurred an error because whatever, uh, uh, whatever, wherever the position was supposed to be, I am off by certain amount. And why am I off by certain amount? Nonlinearity, non right? So I mean, one definition of a plain English language definition of nonlinearity is for equal increments of input, the output doesn't change equally. Right? If for every equal increment of input, the output had changed equally, then it would have been a linear, incrementally a linear system. In this case, clearly it's not a linear, uh, it's not a linear system because for every uh, step of, uh, of, of time, the position is not changing uniformly. So what is the solution? The solution is to say, I will take higher order derivatives so as to approximate the curve better and better, right? So, so what do you, I mean? So then we resort to a Taylor series and what is Taylor series telling us? Taylor series is, te is telling us if we know, if we know the position at, at T naught and you want to predict the position at certain, after certain interval delta T, all we need to know is the present position plus the delta T times the slope plus something has to do with the higher order derivatives and this will be delta T squared, but there is also a factor, factorial two. And similarly, if you go, if you want to include higher order derivatives, this becomes and so on, right? So this, if, if, if this series, if you calculate till infinite number of terms, you will get infinitely precise <laughs> estimate of where you will be at any point of time. But naturally, I mean, uh, infinite series are useful, but as long as they are, if we can get them in a closed form, they are useful. Otherwise, we'll have to make some approximations. So what is the best approximation that we can say? We can say that, hey, I understand that if I neglect certain terms, there will be some error. All I want is to design a framework in which the error is minimal. So in order to do that, what do I need to limit myself to? The question is, I don't want to use this infinite number of terms. I want to use limited number of terms for analysis purposes, okay? And, and also don't, when I'm greedy, I also don't want to incur too much error, okay? So what is, what is the constraint that I'm putting on myself? Pardon? Tolerance, tolerance of what? Yeah. Okay, so I let's say I define the tolerance. By tolerance, you mean I this much amount of maybe uh, if the position is in meters, let's say I say that I am I, uh, I am okay with a precision of 0 0.1 meter, right? That is a tolerance definition, right? So which means I'm okay with certain amount of error. That is a constant that I put on myself. That is number one. So in order to establish that, what do I need to there is another subsequent constraint that comes out of this, this, uh, this constraint. What is that constraint? If you look at the equation, what is this telling you in terms of observation time? <clears throat> right, so if delta t is larger and larger, then if I, if I am trying to extrapolate, let's say I want to extrapolate this plot with a straight line, I can probably do it at the vicinity of of, of the observation of initial observation point. But if I plan to do it somewhere here, maybe the plot has gone something like this, then clearly I will have, I'll link a lot of error. So what constraint then am I imposing on myself? If I have to neglect higher order terms, I'm imposing that I cannot move too much away from the vicinity of the first observation, of the initial observation or the quiescent observation. Right, so this is my quiescent position. S of t naught is my is 
quiescent position around which I am doing all my analysis. And if I want to, if I, if I am lazy and I say that I only want to use first order terms, which means I only want to approximate S of T naught plus delta T using the first two terms. And I'd want to neglect these because this becomes difficult in analysis. Then naturally I am putting a constraint on delta T, right? Because delta T square, delta T cube, those errors will start accumulating as delta T starts becoming larger and larger, okay? So in, we will see that when we go to circuits, when we go to I and V, again, the plots will, will, plots will look similar, but the axis in one case will be V, other case will be I, or one case will be I, other case will be V. In, but the treatment of Taylor series will entail that this, whatever is the delta, whatever is the quiescent deviation that we are looking at should be small with respect to all the so with a, it should be small enough so that I can neglect the higher order terms. And if this, this delta T, let's say is an independent variable in this plot, delta T is an independent variable, right? I, X axis is an independent variable. If this is an independent variable, all we are saying is that there is a minimum, there is a, uh, there is a certain value of delta T or there is a certain constraint on delta T, which I cannot breach if I want certain amount of accuracy which means delta T has to be small enough, right? So that's why we call it small signal. So that is the, I mean, if instead of time, if we, if we plot, let's say voltage or current, that is an electrical sig quantity. So naturally, when you are talk, when we are trying to figure out what the subsequent I or V will be by changing either, uh, 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 changing the independent variable, the constraint that we are putting on ourselves is that the change in independent variable has to be small enough or the signal has to be small enough, right? So from this context also, can you tell me heuristically, uh, will, where, if I take the slope, let's say, if I try to predict my, uh, if I try to predict the position around this point, let's say I call this T1, Right? Will I have a larger uh, acceptable limit of delta t, or will I have a larger acceptable limit of delta t around t naught for the small signal validity? Is the question clear? Is, let me repeat. So what I'm saying is, so let's say you say that uh, I am okay with some error. I fix that error. Right. What I'm asking you is that when you fix the error, what you are essentially saying is that this set of terms, let's say, gives you some error. Let me call this epsilon. Right. So that error will be there. And I am okay with the fact that that epsilon exists. Not what I'm asking is, is epsilon a function of where you are on the curve or it is independent of where you are on the curve? Independent? Why independent? Depend on the delta t. Will it depend only on delta t? Because see, what is the error? S of, error is a function of delta t times the derivative. It's not only delta t. Right. So what is now? If I say that with a very very small i fix, this is the error is epsilon. Right. So then what I'm essentially saying is that this vector is constant, isn't it? Okay, pictorially, you, pictorially, you like, I mean, uh, pictorially, I think it's easier to see. Let's say your, uh, let's say your curve. Let's say your curve uh, goes something like, I am exaggerating here. So let's say this goes something like, this and then go something like this. Okay. So let's say I say I am trying to linearize by linearize. I mean that I am, I am, I am trying to uh, approximate this curve as a straight line around this point T naught. And I'm trying to approximate this curve as a straight line around this point T one. 
right? So, so which means that around T1, I am I'm approximating this curve like this, and around T naught, I'm approximating this curve like this. So now, can you tell me where will and I uh, and I put delta T here, and I put delta T here. So now, can you comment on this? This range of delta t for which a linear approximation will be better. Will it be around t naught or will it be around t1? Naturally, it will be around t1. Why? Because the slope, it seems like, I mean, it's not, it's not changing at all around t1, right? So in other words, it, your small single approximation is a function of where you are sitting on the curve. Right? If you if you are sitting somewhere where the curve itself is changing very rapidly, then you would stand to make a lot of errors if you are not careful and if you deviate from the quiescent point. Okay, so to, so essentially the things to note is Taylor series is of help because I can break down a polynomial function. I can break down any function in a uh, or I, if I have to be mathematically correct, then I should say that I can break down any differentiable function into a into a polynomial function, and and what Taylor series entails us enables us to do is, to, is it helps us in visualizing which is the first order term, which is the second order term, which is the third order term, and so on. And we have seen that this second order, third order terms are pesky because if I apply a sinusoid, they will lead to uh, frequencies of that will lead to harmonic frequencies, which we don't want from an amplifier, which means it is in our benefit to keep the dominance of the or the contribution of the higher order terms to as low as possible, which means that I should limit the operation of, of whatever device I am looking at to only that region where the first order terms dominate, right? Which essentially means that I have to be aware where on the on the characteristics of the device I am sitting at. Because if I if I am sitting at somewhere on the characteristics of a device where the, the characteristics is also changing rapidly, right, in a nonlinear fashion, then I stand to lose a lot of, I, or rather I stand to gain a lot of error, which, which is which is never a good idea. Okay, so this is all I uh, this all this explanation was is from the context of uh, of driving a vehicle. The same con same. I mean, uh, when you go to INV, right? Uh, the the uh, the mathematics remains the same as the context changes, right? So what is the context then? Let's say I have a device. Let's say I have a nonlinear device whose voltage across. I I I say this is. Uh, v, this current is I. So I have a nonlinear device which uh, which is which relates the I to V as I equal to some nonlinear function f of V, right? And this I say that, and if I plot this characteristics again, let's say this I and V are related something like this, right? And I want to approximate the I and V characteristics using a straight line. If I just give you that statement that I want to approximate these characteristics is in a straight line, you should immediately come back and ask me, where should I approximate it? Because this approximation will not be same if I am sitting somewhere here, or if I'm sitting somewhere here, or I'm sitting somewhere. Here. So it is an insufficient information I'll give you if I just say approximate the characteristics using a straight line. Okay, so when you become a designer, and you go to the industry or you go uh, for uh, any other uh, responsibility, these are the questions that you have to ask yourself or ask to yourself, right? So if given a device which has certain set of characteristics, right, how, how do I, uh, I mean, where do I, uh, in order to get an accurate understanding of where, what the INV or the incremental INV will be, I need to understand where I am taking the slopes, okay? So again, this is very heuristic till now. So now let's now let's get deep into uh, start getting deep into uh, some detail. So let's say this is a nonlinear device and uh, f of v, and I I tell you that 
it, it is uh, this uh, this is characterized as let's say i naught plus a one v plus a two v squared. Right. So let's say this is a device that does this. Okay. And I what I do is I say I I will apply a voltage. Let's say V D C. Right. So let me call this V in. V D C we call this V in. I apply voltage V in. What will be the current? <coughs> What will be the current I? This is I is a function of V, right? So I of V. Right. So I'll just simply, I mean, V the V V in appears across the device directly. So I can simply plug in. So I of V in will be I naught plus A1 V in plus A2 V in squared. Okay. So looks pretty simple, right? I mean, why do I need to bother about nonlinearity? Or did I need to bother about, uh, I mean, making approximations because I plug in V in, I get I in, right? Straight away, simple uh, plugging in a number, right? But let's make it uh, slightly more interesting. And we say that instead of this, let's say I have a register in series. And I call this V out now because now I'll have to distinguish uh, between these. So what will be I naught or what will be I out? So can you, uh, so now tell me how will you go about finding out what I out is, what, what V out is? Right, okay, so I out is, V in minus V out times G. I don't like putting things in denominator. Okay, so uh, unless I really have to. So, so, so let's say this is, so this doesn't give me I out or V out, right? This does give the relation, then what? So my goal is to plot, let's say, V out with respect to V in. So this is my final goal. So let's say I want to understand V out will be some function G of V in. Right, so I need to understand this. So how will I go about figuring this out? Correct. So can you help me out now? What should I do? <laughs> You're right. I out is also a function of. So what should I do? What is the next thing that I should do? Can you speak up? I couldn't hear. Yeah. So that's what, that's what this was, right? If you. Isn't it? Ah, okay. So, so I see. I ultimately there are. Uh, it's a loop. So, so let me come back to a general question. In order to solve the current and the voltage in a loop, what is the most generic way of solving it? KVL, KCL. Is that only it, or do you need something else? I can't hear. Can you speak up? Right, right. So relation of all the current and the voltages of all the devices in the circuit. If you have a R, we just say IR because I know the relationship between I and V is established, right? Right. So if I have a capacitor, I know the relationship between I and V is established. So I need an established relationship between the currents and voltages of all the devices that are part of the network. So you need basically two things. You need the you need to solve KVL, KCL, definitely. But in order to solve that, you also need the relationship between I and V. 
for a particular device, right? Otherwise, what will you solve for? Correct. So, what is the I and V relationship here? The I and V relationship in this case is I out is equal to I naught plus A one V out squared, or rather A one V out. Plus a to the out squared. Correct. So you get a system of equations, system of nonlinear equations, right? So this is equation one, this is equation two, and you solve it, right? So let me give you some numbers. Why don't you solve it and tell me what is and what it will be? So let's say V in is equal to two volt. Uh, R is equal to one kilo ohm. Which means G is one milli Siemens. Let's say I naught is equal to one milliamps, A one equal to one milli Siemens. Or if you are not familiar with using Siemens, then it becomes one milliamp per volt. What will be the unit of A two? Right. Yeah, so ampere per volt square. Let me just say that this is one milliamp per volt square, right? So why don't you solve for I out and V out and tell me what it will be? So what is it? Can you shout it out? So V out will be there will be two answers, right? Minus two point four. And minus 0.4, let's say. Sorry, plus 0.4, right? Yeah, plus 0.4 volts. Right? So, similarly, what will be I out if I plug in those numbers into point five nine? And in this case, it will be other case. Four point four milliamps. Okay, good. So some of you uh, implicitly neglected the minus two point four. Uh, I assume you neglected because you you didn't want to take you didn't want to assume that that the out can go negative, right? That is a practical assumption in most devices, but I didn't tell you anything in this case, right? So if I didn't, don't tell you anything, then obviously you cannot make that approximation. But yeah, so if, if I make that approximation that uh, the minimum, I mean, this relationship is valid only for positive values of V out and for negative values of V out, I out is zero, then obviously you, I mean, this, this will not be valid. The only other constraint, well, only other uh, uh, solution that you get will be valid. So, so when you are doing a full blown analysis of a nonlinear set of equations, you will have to be careful with this because you'll get multiple solutions. You'll have to go back and check which solution is, is valid. It might as well be uh, some solution is valid for certain parts of the curve, some solution is valid for certain other parts of the curve. So when you write out the equation using some assumptions, you will see that this solution that you have gotten, maybe that initially thought was probably not right because it's not fitting in that, that particular part of that. Okay, so this will become clear as we go on, but this is something that we, that we should keep in mind, right? So now what did you do in order to solve this? You wrote out the quadratic, you wrote out the minus V plus minus whatever, right? So, and you found out the answers. Now, if I suddenly tell you that this is no longer a quadratic, it becomes plus a three v naught q, right? Then what do you do? Uh, then, then I say plus a five v naught v out to the power five. Then what do you do? And these are practical devices which have these type of characteristics, right? It's not necessary that just because we are comfortable with quadratic, all the devices suddenly become quadratic. Okay. So, so then naturally the question that arises is that uh, then what do we do about uh, what we do uh, going forward, right? And you already know the answer. We have been leading up to this using Taylor series and all. So let's let's do a, a, a graphical uh, let's do a graphical analysis. So let's say I plot 
B out with respect to I out. And I already told you the relationship IB characteristics of the device is I not plus. Okay. And I, I not A1, A2 are all positive. So if I uh, if I plot this on, on this, and this is only for V greater than or equal to zero. And let's assume I V equal to zero, I of V equal to zero for negative V. So in that case, how will this plot look like approximately? It's a parabola, right? It's a parabola. At V equal to zero, I have a non-zero value of I naught. And then it becomes a parabola. Okay. Fine. Uh, at negative v, this will be ground. This will, by ground, I mean this will be zero. So don't have to bother. So this is one equation that was the quadratic that you used to solve. What was the other equation that you used to solve? This one. Right. So if I plot that here, let me write it out. So i out is equal to v in g minus v out v. Let's say V in is equal to two volt in our case, right? So this is two times one milli Siemens minus V out times G. So this is two milliamps minus V out times G is one milli Siemens. So how will this plot look like? Straight line with a slope of minus one, right? Uh, so, so this will look something like this. And what is this? What 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 is this point? Pardon? Uh, can you speak up? I can't hear you. Ah, okay. So that is a solution. So this point is uh, zero point four, and this point is. Uh, 0.56, right? 0 0.56 milliamps. Okay, great. So now, uh, yes. Yes. Pardon? I not is one milliamp. Oh, correct, correct, correct. Yes, 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 yes. Right, right, correct. So something is wrong, right? So what is wrong then? Ah, okay, it's an inverted parabola, correct? Yes, thank you. But that is also not correct, right? Because one point six million. Ah, okay, right. One point six. Yes. Ah, very good observation. Thank you. So let me draw this. So this becomes 1.6 milliamps. Great. So now I now I say that okay. So this was uh, this was for an input of this. Uh, okay, I could plot this again, right? So so this is this plot is for V in of two volts. Now I say that I become greedy. I want to plot. I want to find out what this new I and V will be if V in is 2.1 volts, say, right? So I, I change my uh, requirement. Now I say V in is equal to 2.1 volt, right? So uh, what do I do? One thing is go back to that set of equations, right? What you have, solve it again, plug in the values you get. The other thing is uh, to appreciate the fact that, see, I mean, uh, which, which of these two plots will change? In this, in the way I have drawn it, will the uh, will this plot change or will the straight line plot change? The straight line plot will change, right? Great. So straight line plot will move up or down? Move up, right? Because ultimately this is what. Okay. So the straight line plot will move up. So this will move up. This difference will. I mean, will be equivalent to 0 0.1 volt because that's where you, you meet the uh, x-axis. And then what am I saying? I'm, all I'm saying is, why don't you tell find the 
with a new point. Now, that you can always do by plugging in the numbers again. But as you can see now, in here the numbers were round and nice. Now it becomes 2.1, then 2.13, and all those things. And things become messier and messier. So what is Taylor series telling us now? The Taylor series is telling us, so as long as you are willing to, as you are promising that you are not deviating from the initial point that you put in an effort to find, I can help you out. What is it saying? It is essentially saying that hey, now you do this one thing, you, you say that around that quiescent uh, I and V that you put in that effort to uh, find, uh, your I and V characteristic is a straight line. And then you solve for two system, a system of equations, but the, now the new system of equations are two straight line equations, right? This magenta curve and this, and this green curve. So now suddenly things become simpler because I mean, had this instead of being a parabola been a third order equation or a fifth order equation, it was out of question that you could have done it analytically, right? So those, so what, that's why what circuit designers generally do is to say that we will leave the operating point or rather the initial I and V positions to a numerical simulator to figure it out. Or we'll make some crude approximations, right? Uh, to, to figure it out. And then after that, we will take over the analysis. The analysis that we'll take over is to say that if, if I'm only interested in changes around that initial point, then I will linearize by figuring out what the slope will be, right? And then system of linear equations, I'm good. Okay. And uh, so by the way, before I move on, what will be the equation of this straight line? Can you shout it out, someone? Two V out. How did you get that? Oh, okay, you got that. That is a slope, right? So, but equation of a straight line is what? Then slope is one part. So, all I'm asking, what? Correct. So like okay, exactly, right? So you know the point and the slope. So essentially it becomes y2 minus y1 by x2 minus x1 is equal to slope. So in general, this becomes v out. My, so in this case, y axis is i, right? So i out minus 1.6 milli by v out minus 0 0.4 milli is equal to the slope. And the slope is what? Slope is a1 plus Two a two v which v value point four right so then you have this equation and you have this equation and you solve for it. system of linear equations I mean uh, easy to solve we can do that so what I want you to do is do it yourself not now after you go back do it yourself for uh, v in equal to 2.1 volt using this methodology and using the brute force, right? Quadratics <laughs> and see what's the difference. Okay. So satisfy yourself that the difference is high or low. And let's say it's, let's say you are not satisfied that it is very high. Uh, it is not too low. Then obviously what is the solution? You say that uh, this probably this approximation is not valid. If I deviate 100 millivolt from my initial quiescent point, I'll say, okay, fine. If it's not valid for 100 millivolt, check for 50 millivolt. Let's check for 10 millivolt. Somewhere it will be valid, right? Wherever it will be valid will be my constraint. I'll have to, as a designer, I have to honor. Okay, so if you, if you, don't, value, if you don't honor that constraint, higher order terms will start dominating. The effect is that if you have a signal somewhere in the circuit at omega naught, you will get two omega naught, three omega naught, and so on, which we don't want. Okay. Okay, any questions? No? Okay, fine. So this is the graphical way of, this is the graphical way of visualizing things, but we can, again, we cannot always keep on drawing graphs. Uh, uh, so, so what uh, much smarter people before me figured it out is, is this. Uh, why don't we? 
try and why don't we try and uh, formalize this in a mathematical model and and that is as follows What we are essentially saying is that that one time pain you'll have to incur, right? You have to figure out, uh, let's say a V in equal to two volt as we took in the earlier uh, example, that one time pain you have to incur and you figured out whatever that quiescent I and Vs are in, in the network. And let's say for this case, for V in equal to V in Q, where Q stands for quiescent, I have I out is equal to I not Q and V out is equal to V not Q. Okay. Then I say that I change this V in, I perturb this V in by a small signal, right? A small input. So I say this is V in plus delta V in. I applied an incremental input, a small input. If I want to tie it together with the previous, with the example that we are doing, let's say V in is two volt, delta V in is 0.1 volt, right? So uh, without knowing anything more, I can say that both this V out and I out will get perturbed. So I'll just say that this output is now, output current is now delta I out, and this is delta V out, right? Okay, so what should I do now? I will summon Teller and say that. Firstly, we know that I out or I not Q, I not Q is F of V not Q. This is, this we, we cannot get away with. We'll have to do this one time analysis. But then we say that we, after we have perturbed the system, the new I naught will be I naught Q plus delta I out, which is F of V naught Q plus delta V out, right? So far so good. Then what's next? I'll say that I'll assume to start off or yeah, I'll assume to start off that delta V out is sufficiently small enough, right? Even if I don't assume, I can say that if it's differentiable, I can write it out as a Taylor series. And I, let me write it out first, then we'll make the assumption. So let's say I write it out, this is V of Q plus delta V out, F dash V of Q plus, plus higher order terms. And if I assume, if I make the assumption uh, that the input perturbation is such that that leads to an output perturb perturbation such that I can neglect these higher order terms and only the first two terms dominate, right? If, if, if I, or rather only the first term dominates over all the increments, then I can, I can, approximate this stuff as I naught Q plus delta I naught. Okay. Now, why am I doing all these things? I'm doing all these things because if you note, if you notice this equation, And if you notice this equation, you see that I naught Q is exactly equal to F of V naught Q, no approximations there, which means I get a 
I get a linear relationship between the incremental output, delta I out, incremental change in output, output uh, current with the incremental change in the output voltage, right? So it looks like this, this, this seems promising, but still note that I haven't been able to, uh, I haven't been able to figure out what is the relationship between the incremental input and the incremental output, right? So this, this relationship only establishes the relationship between the incremental current at an incremental uh, uh, voltage across the device. Okay, so now, uh, so, the, so, the, so the next thing to do is essentially, uh, uh, essentially write out, uh, write out the full equation in the sense that Now, if I if I uh, write out the full equation, if I write out the KVL in the loop, what do I get? I essentially get V in Q plus delta V in is equal to I naught Q R plus delta I out R plus V dot Q plus delta V out, right? What do you think will cancel? Will anything cancel before I say what do you think will cancel? So when when we were doing quiescent operation, right? When we were doing quiescent operation, what did we see? This is V in Q, this is I naught Q, and this is V of Q. And this is R which essentially means that V in Q is equal to I naught Q R plus V of Q, correct? So that's basically, if you go around the loop, it becomes zero, right? So essentially these two terms combined cancels this. So you get delta V in is equal to delta I out R plus Delta V out, right? So now this seems promising now because now we are in completely linear domain and we also know the relationship between delta I out and delta V out, right? So if I, if I simply replace this delta V out in terms of delta I out, I get delta I out R plus Fine, which means your delta V in is nothing but delta I out R plus one by dash V of Q. Okay. This is pure algebra. I mean, just be careful with the algebra and this is what you'll get. But the interpretation is electrical. This is the important part. So what do you think if I, if, I, if I tell you that I have a signal and I'm calling this delta I out, uh, sorry, I'm calling this delta V in and I have an output. So I have a network, let's say I have a network where I have applied a signal delta V in and I am observing this current delta I out and the relationship between delta V in and delta I out is this. So what will you conclude what is there in the box? Uh, anybody else? With the value of R. Ah, right. So an impedance with the value of R plus one over F dash V or Q. R is R. When you when you add two impedances in electrical domain, what you say is that they are in series. Correct. So essentially, what I am saying is 
this is what I'll inquire. This is you have R and and you have another resistor. And provided this F dash V O Q is all real and positive and all those things, right? So if that is true, then this is F dash V O Q. Is a, uh, this is a resistor of value one over F dash V O Q. Correct? Fine. So, so what is so profound about this? Right. So now you see there is nothing nonlinear here, right? So all resistances, and uh, in this case, is a resistor and a voltage source. And we know we are good at we have been solving this for kingdom come, right? So we are good with this. So we can we can now essentially figure out the relationship between any node voltage. I mean, I saw, showed it with you with a first order circuit. I mean, with a single loop. But let's say you you, you have multiple loops, right? So if I am able to replace all the nonlinear equivalent with something which looks like a linear set, linear network or linear element, then I should be able to replace all the nonlinear elements in the in my network with a linearized equivalent version of it. Correct. And linearized equivalent versions are easy to easy to deal. With. What is the linearized equivalent version? The linearized equivalent version, the value of the resistor R, or at least let me call this incremental resistor R, is one over the slope at <laughs> slope of the IV characteristics of the nonlinear device evaluated at an operating point, not anywhere, evaluated at an operating point. If the operating point changes, this value of this slope will change, which means this stuff, this R is a function of the operating point of the network. This R is not, this R is fixed, right? The incremental, Incremental R is a function of the operating point of the network. And it is only by this relationship between, uh, it is it is the only relationship that is tying this network to the mother network is the fact that this stuff here is a function of the mother network. Otherwise you don't even need to know what the original network was, right? So the only way this incremental network or this small signal network is, related to the original network is to the fact that the incremental characteristics or the incremental value that we could get out of it is related to the slope of the characteristics that we got from the original network. If the slope were not a function of the, uh, of the operating region, then we need not have bothered. So quickly, if the slope of I and V is not a function of where you take the slope at, what is that element? Can you tell me what it is? If the slope is not a function of where you are taking the slope at. Fine, yeah, it will be linear. In IV characteristics, linear, what is it? So there is right? I equal to G times V, right? So that's why you, I mean, any network can be, you can take the slope and replace its elements, right? In this case, we did not bother about, we did not, didn't bother about replacing the R with its nonlinear, with its nonlinear equivalent, primarily it's linear, it's not a nonlinear uh, element, but this R could as well have been another nonlinear element. I could have as well said that starting point of my network is this. So let's say this is another element whose uh, IV characteristics is related by I is equal to F1 of, let's say this is V1, and this is V2, and this IV characteristics related as I F2 or V2, right? I could have done this also. So if I had done this, what would have been the next step if I asked for an incremental network? What would you have done? So I want to, I, I again, the motivation is we are not good at getting intuition from these type of networks. I want to linearize it. So what do you do? How do you linearize? 
what we what are the steps step 1 find poisson points right so step 1 is find q points <laughs> using numerical brute force whatever approximation is allowed you do that step 2 step 2 is what find the slope find the slope of and the slope in the iv characteristics of each device around the q point and what is the final step replace replace the nonlinear device or you can just say any device if it's true for nonlinear it's definitely true for linear replace the device with a resistor of value 1 over slope okay make sense so this essentially is a three point formula to analyze any nonlinear network right but the background of this is 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 grounded in in solid maths that you start off with tell you start off with nonlinear iv characteristics you ex, expand the taylor series for incremental and then you honor the fact that i can neglect the higher order terms and under the condition that you have honored it you can you can do similarity and you can replace the nonlinear elements in the network with its linearized equivalents okay any questions okay so if there are no questions let me show you the same thing in a in 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 in, in another way right So let's say I take the same network. Uh, let's say I, I mean now I can freely take multiple nonlinear elements. Let's say this is so let's say this is D in. Let's say this is D1. Let's say this is D2. Okay. And then uh, we said that okay, so so the current here, current through this element was I out. Let me call this I one. No, I one will not be right because it's the same loop. So let's say I out. Uh, let's say this current is also I out. Okay. And then what do I do? I, what am I after? I am after that if I apply an incremental uh, input delta v in. By the way, this I mean I alluded to this in the previous class, but uh, it's probably makes sense to allude it, allude, allude to it right now also. That why one of the other reasons we are interested in these increments is because all your signals are increments. Right, your signals are hardly ever DC. DC doesn't have any information. It is only when something changes you have information. Ultimately, we are trying to make networks for communication purposes, which means we want to transfer information from one end of the from some point to another. Which means we are interested in increments. We are in interested in the change. So that's why uh, a quiescent point from a communication perspective doesn't have any value. The only value is how much change you can transfer. Right. So that's why we are. Uh, in a on a broader philosophical level, we are interested in change. We are interested in increments, right? Okay, fine. So now we, we, we I change it to v in. I change to uh, v in plus delta v in. So v one will change to v one plus delta v one. V two will change to v two plus delta v two. Similarly, i two will change. Let's see, call it delta i only. Okay. So. So what I'll do now is to uh, try to convince you 
that you probably don't need to do all this bunch of maths. You can use some circuit trickery to come up with similar conclusions that we did. Okay, so so the, we'll approach it in this way. So let's say this is their network right now, and I apply, and and I apply a current source here of value zero. Will it change anything in the network? Nothing, right? No current array. So so I will. What I will do is I will. Zero can be obtained from multiple ways. I can add something, subtract something, subtract the same thing, I get zero, correct? So what I'll do, I will add a current source, a non-zero current source of value i out, okay? And I will take out this current from this node by another current source of value i out. This was. This current was I out plus delta I, right? So this is I out. So if I look at only this node, have I injected any extra current? No, but I have injected extra current probably at this node, correct? So I don't want to do that. I want to ensure that all nodes have zero current. So what I'll do, what should I do? I could take out this current that is I am injecting and plug it in here, right? So now I have three nodes in the network. Do you think in any node I have plugged in non-zero current? Yes or no? No, right? So at, if you look at any node, I out, I mean, I have injected I out and I have taken I out out. So nothing has changed, right? No INV will change in the network. You're convinced, right? Okay, great. So similarly, let's say I, I don't put this I out now, let's keep it here. If I, I will inject, I will put them back uh, shortly. Similarly, let's say I, I, uh, I do something similar with the voltage sources. But why, 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 by that, what I mean is I, I add a voltage source in the opposite polarity in uh, uh, in this in, uh, in this branch right similarly i add, add a voltage source of opposite polarity of value delta v2 in this branch okay you see i'm well, so not delta v2 sorry so v2 v2 Similarly, I add uh, another voltage source of value V1 in this branch, correct? So do you think anything will change? Something will change? What will change? Current will change? Why? This is not equal to V1. Okay, so now tell me one thing. When I didn't have delta V in, what was the relationship between V in, V1, and V2? V in was equal to V1 plus V2. Sir? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, correct, correct. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the way I had done. Yeah. Thanks. Correct. So V in, I mean, when I didn't have anything, V in was equal to V1 plus V2, right? So that's KVL. So I have basically then, uh, if I go around the loop, I should get zero additional drop, correct? Okay? Agree? So, so now I put back these current sources, right? So now if I do this, what do I see? I see if I now reduce this circuit, individually this V in plus V in and minus V in cancel. Okay. What am I left with? Delta V in. By the way, what was, uh, let me start off with this branch, the top branch. 
so that will make the point uh, clearer so in the top branch i i had uh, a plus v1 and minus v1 gets cancelled and i'm left with delta v1 what about the current right i can i can this delta i out this i out plus delta i out i can always say this is equivalent to saying this is i out and this is delta i out delta i right what i was using delta i correct so if i if i look into from these two nodes the amount of current going into the node and amount the amount of current coming out of the node remains identical but now this in this top two current sources circulate among each other and they don't really affect my operation correct so so this becomes delta i okay so similarly this becomes delta v2 and this is delta i similarly this becomes only delta v in that's it correct do you agree or something fishy is happening do you agree or not delta i out right i mean yeah what was the point no right so this i out will again get cancelled right so so i i have the i out plus delta i here so i can say that this is equivalent to saying i have i can do it in all branches isn't it so i have i out here i essentially didn't add anything so there's no point in subtracting also right so i clubbed those things together so that all the dc parts quiescent parts gets cancelled right so if i if you go back to the previous analysis we did what did we do we wrote out the incremental and we subtracted one equation with other correct so that was done in a algebraic uh, domain i am doing it in the circuit domain i am subtracting the quiescent correct so what i am referring to is this so we subtracted this from this right this entire stuff so that's how we got rid of i o q i got rid of i o q and v o q because we could subtract the quiescent from the increment from the total uh, total excitation to only get the incremental excitations so this is what we are doing here i i did some mathematical uh, rather circuit jugglery to get rid of the incremental uh, the quiescent information from the network and i only limited myself to the incremental informations not that till now i have not made any approximations this delta i and delta, the relationship between delta i and delta v can as well be non linear i haven't made any approximation all i said was there will be some change but small here the small signal the small signal approximation that comes in here is telling us that the relationship between delta i and delta v is so delta v1 is equal to 1 over slope around the quiescent point v1 times delta i1 similarly delta v2 is 1 over slope around quiescent point v2 times delta uh, delta i in this case right so uh, times delta i so this is the this is the approximation this is the small signal approximation right so moment i get this approximation moment i get the slope information all i can do is to say that i'll have this delta v in this becomes this this becomes this this is r1 this is r2 where r1 is this slope r2 is this slope right so and this becomes your delta v out okay so i showed this for a single loop network 
and it's basically pretty simple to do it for the multi loop network also if you i mean if you want to i mean you can try it out for multi loop network by following the same principles that i did in this adding and subtracting quotient in 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 a circuit domain forget about the taylor series and subtracting quotient from the total okay do it yourself once it will be i mean it, it will get better insights rather than watching someone do it okay any questions okay then we'll stop we'll meet on monday <laughs>